Shalom. Shalom, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us today in this uh, beautiful Shabbat morning. And uh, today is um, the 19th of March, and today is going to be Parashat Tzav, which means command. And we're going to be talking about the sacrifice of praise. My name is Rabbi Harel Kwenkvarai, and I just want to thank you for joining us again. Uh, so today's Torah portion comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 1, to chapter 8, verse 36. Mm -hmm. And there's two um, books to be read for the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion. The main one that is read is from Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 21, to chapter 8, verse 3, and then also chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. And then there's also Malachi, chapter 3, verses 4 to 24. And lastly... The Brit Harashah, or the New Covenant, is read from Mark chapter 7, verse 31, to chapter 8, verse 37, <clears throat> and chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Then we read from the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 58. So there's not a whole lot of reading to do this week compared to some other weeks, but it's always wonderful to see how it all ties together. So before we start together, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> just open this time in prayer. Abba Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity, the privilege and honor it is to simply be called yours because of our faith in Yeshua, in Jesus, and that no matter what nationality we come from, <clears throat> those who believe in Yeshua will be saved. And we thank you for this truth. And we ask you, to simply uh, be with us today, guide me in everything that I say, that all that will come out of my mouth will come from you. In the name of Yeshua, amen. <clears throat> so we will open up with the first verse, first two verses, Leviticus 7, verses 37 and 38. These then are the regulations for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ordination offering, and the fellowship offering which the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai in the desert of Sinai. And as last week's parasha, Hashem had given Moses the laws of the korbanot, which were animal and meal offerings. <clears throat> Those offerings include the ola, which is the ascending or rising offering. The mincha, which is the meal offering. Shalamim, which is the peace offering. Hatat, which is a sin offering for unintentional sin. And the asham, or the guilt offering. There's so many types of offerings. Uh, <clears throat> as I was looking through this portion, I thought, wow, I cannot imagine being a priest at the time and remembering everything you had to do for every type of offering because every type of offering had different things you had to do to the animals. I can't even imagine having to remember all that. So I'm very glad that, that these things are no longer necessary. <laughs> And, um, and that Yeshua took that uh, sacrifice upon himself. So in this week's Torah portion, Hashem describes the different laws of sacrifices, as I said, providing a distinction in the process for sin offerings, burnt offerings, and thank offerings. Hashem also gives a priest an ordination offering, <coughs> a specific one for when they're going to be ordained into the service. So while these Offerings may seem strange and even outrageous to our modern days. Understanding them really helps us to understand what and why Yeshua had to and what he did for us on the cross and why his death was necessary. Okay, so uh, these offerings also shed light on the New Covenant or New Testament, in particular, the challenging epistle to the Hebrews. So... I suggest you read the book of Hebrews. It's very enlightening and very important. Now I'd like to talk about the Torah or the, <clears throat> the law of the burnt offering. All right, remember the word Torah means um, uh, help or also is um, a way of living, right? Just So it does simply just mean law. In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 8 through 9, the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons this command. These are the regulations, Torah, for the burnt offering. 
So the burnt offerings, which are blood sacrifices of perfectly innocent animals, right? They haven't sinned. They don't sin. <laughs> they are impressed upon the penitent, the seriousness of their sin before Hashem. They're supposed to, at least. You know, thinking this poor animal is dying because I sinned. All right, so Tzav describes the burnt offerings which were offered every morning and evening on a fire that burned continuously. So these, regardless of any other offerings that were brought during the day, these had to be done in the morning and in the evening. It says in Leviticus 6.13, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So that eternal flame is a good analogy for our love for our Shem, for our creator. We, we I suggest we need to tend to the fire in our heart <clears throat> for Hashem. Never let it go out. How do we do that? Praying, reading his word, being with him, talking to him. That's what prayer is anyway, right? It's talking to our father and to our savior. So now we're going to go to a different thing about what it means to suffer outside the camp. And here's a very interesting uh, point. It says in Hebrews 13, 11 through 12, the high priest, or Kohen Hagadol, carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Yeshua, Jesus, also suffered outside the city gate <clears throat> to make the people holy through his own blood. So Leviticus specifies that the Kohen, or the priests, were to carry the ashes of the burnt offerings outside the camp in Leviticus 8.11. In prophetic fulfillment of this, Yeshua also gave himself as an offering outside the gates of the camp. And there's a place in Jerusalem outside the gates. If you go there, it's called the garden tomb. There's an actual garden people have bought. And it uh, shows the empty tomb. And just a few yards to the right of the empty tomb is Golgotha. Okay, it's just a, a rock. It looks like a skull, kind of. And it's not very tall. You'd think it was something taller, but it's not. And that's where he was crucified. So it's so incredible to see. So although it says we are required to go outside the camp to Yeshua, where we may have become objects of reproach and be considered unclean by many, we are in Hashem's sight, holy as he is holy. How are we holy? I sin every day. How am I holy? Well, I'm holy because I believe in Yeshua. I accept his sacrifice for me, his blood upon me. That's it. I can not be holy in my own way, in my own actions. But he makes us holy through his sacrifice, through his blood. And I am very happy about that. <laughs> so it says in Hebrews 13, 13, let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. What does that mean? To be outside of the world, not be part of the world. Yes, we're here in the world. But we don't want to be like the world. That's like being outside the camp. Okay. So although we may be hated by men, especially if we stand up for what is right and declare, hey, this is not okay. This is sin. This is not okay. We need to repent. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm seeing many so-called believers now that are saying, oh, but we need to understand where the person is. And yeah, we need to understand because Everybody has been a sinner. We also need to understand that that person needs to come out of that sin and repent, ask for forgiveness and accept Yeshua, Jesus as their savior. Not to say, oh, he just loves you the way you are. Just come on. He does love us the way we are, but he also causes change inside our heart. Okay. Talking about sin, any kind of sin, uh, homosexuality, trans, uh, bestiality, um, <clears throat> all the sexual sins, all right? Thief, all right? Stealing, lying, gossiping. And there's a whole list of witchcraft. People who do magic. I've seen all these people call themselves Christians. They do magic and witchcraft. I don't know where that fits in with the Bible and with God's ways. And in fact, it says in the Bible, those who do these things will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay. They won't. That's it. So, yeah, we need to love people. We need to let them know, though, that, hey, Yeshua, Jesus loves you, but he wants to heal you of this. He wants to deliver you of this. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
although we may be hated by men, like I said, and sometimes feel defeated and downcast, we know we are deeply accepted by our beloved Father in heaven. And this is found in Ephesians 1, 6. So may Hashem fill you with the deep knowledge of his love, that you will be willing to suffer outside the camp and stand alone in the truth if need be. And trust me, it will be so in the coming near future. Hashem delights in you. Okay, and he will give you that strength if you ask him. And that's the truth. It's going to come the time where we have to stand up for what is right. Not just accept what's given to us and thrown at us by the world. Not okay. Now let's talk about what thank offering means and the sacrifice of praise. In Leviticus 7.12 it says, If he offers it as an expression of thankfulness, then along with his thank offering, he is to offer cakes of bread made without yeast and mixed with oil. Wafers made without yeast and spread with oil and cakes of fine flour, well kneaded and mixed with oil. <clears throat> now, this is really interesting that the peace offering of thanksgiving is so important that when King David brought the Ark of God, the Ark of Hashem, back to its place in the tabernacle, the first thing he did was offer burnt offerings and peace offerings after he danced, right? He also appointed some <laughs> the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel with psalms, stringed instruments, harps, cymbals, and the shofar, the ram's horn. So it says in 1 Chronicles 16, 4, he, David, appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord, to extol, thank, and praise the Lord, the God of Israel. So Hashem is good, merciful, faithful, and he has done so much for us. I know he's done so much for me. He has saved my life numerous of times. I'm talking physically not just spiritually, all right, but both. <clears throat> he has saved me from circumstances which would surely kill me or gotten me in serious trouble. And not only that, above all, I have his salvation through Yeshua. That's it. That's all I know. So there are times when all we can do, and I know I can say this, we can stand in awe and say, thank you, Abba. Thank you, Father. Thank offerings are regarded by rabbis as the supreme type of sacrifice. If you think about it, according to, uh, it's the hardest thing to do when you're going through a hard time, for example. And that's what we're called to do. Give thanks in all circumstances, good or bad. I've seen Hashem, I've seen Adonai change a situation for me that was going not in a good direction. As soon as I would praise him. He changed it over and caused it to go in the opposite direction, the good direction for me instantly. Or he gave me the grace to get through whatever I had to go through. One or the other, praising him for anything will, will help you. It can heal you. It can deliver you. So uh, I hear a lot of people complaining about, about world leaders and this and that. Well, guess what? It's all part of Hashem's plan anyway. So there's no sense of complaining what, Hashem already said would happen. Okay. All right. The wars and things going on, they're all part of his plan. They're all written in the book of Daniel, in Revelation, and other books. It's all part of his end time plan. So stop complaining and praise him because that's what we're to do. All right. That's what we are to do as believers. Now, according to rabbinic tradition, in the messianic era, that is when Yeshua comes and reigns for a thousand years, and then obviously for eternity on the new heaven and new earth, all sacrifices will have completed their educational mission. So there will be no more sacrifices, right? We know that. Anyway, all except the one, <clears throat> there will be a sacrifice of thanks. There will be thanks and sacrifices made, at least during a thousand years reign. The sacrifice of praise is to remain and will continue forever, according to rabbinic tradition. Even in eternities, we will be singing with the angels. And this is true. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. In Hebrew, it's Hodu Adonai Kitov, Ki Leolam Chad Tov. That's beautiful. And we're going to be singing that forever and ever, at least those who believe in Yeshua. So, through Yeshua, Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, Hebrews 13, 15. <clears throat> so offering our thanksgiving and praise to Hashem is the greatest sacrifice we could possibly give, especially, like I said, when things don't seem to be going our way and our flesh doesn't feel like praising and thanking 
our almighty God. And that's not easy. Like I said, I know I've had to do it through gritted teeth many times. But the more you do it, I would literally repeat sometimes praises every five minutes or every so many minutes. And it got to be where I start out with gritted teeth and I would end up just happy. Just so full of joy that would just come bubbling out. It was so incredible. I still, to this day, do the best I can do to praise my God for everything, including the bad. So in Psalm 50, 23, it says, he who sacrifices thank offerings honors me and he prepares the way so that I may show him the salvation of God. So gratitude is so important, people. Becoming a truly thankful person is really transforming. Instead of complaining about the price of food going up, and I find myself doing that sometimes, uh, it is going up and it's going to continue to go up. And it says in the Bible, it'll, and eventually it'll be a day's wages for a little bit of flour. So if you're not stocking up now, I've already warned you. <laughs> but price of gas. All right, here in America, can't really complain much. It's expensive, yes. But in Italy, we pay $9 a gallon. And there's other countries that pay more. So until you can pay that, <laughs> you start paying that, I really wouldn't complain too much. Maybe you want to trade down in your vehicle, make it a little smaller. But what I'm saying is this. We should be happy. We should be happy about everything that's happening. Why? <clears throat> First of all, we know who we belong to. And no matter what happens, he will provide. Secondly, that means we are so close to going home. It's incredible. I can feel it. I can feel the change. I can feel what's going on. And it's incredible. It doesn't scare me. It just makes me more excited. Like, wow, what's going to happen? And how fast it's happening. Like, a, like it says in the Bible, woman having birth pains. Well, what happens with birth pains? They come faster and faster, right? Once they start, they get quicker and quicker. So that's all. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. But for us, it means salvation. It means going home. So we need to notice the good thing that Hashem does for us each and every day, right? you got food on your table, no matter what's going on. Do you have a car to drive? Can you get to work? Are you healthy? Many good things happen to us every day. We know you, we just take for granted. We don't think about it. We need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude also for those people Hashem has placed in our lives, whether you might like them or not. <laughs> there are some people we don't like too much. Okay. Doesn't matter. He put them there for a reason. Now, Albert Einstein, who was the most famous Jewish physicist in the world, said, a hundred times every day, I remind myself that my inner and outer life depends on the labors of other men living and dead, and that I must exert myself in order to give in the measure as I have received and am still receiving. Okay. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived from 1906 to 1945, was a Lutheran pastor, right, in Germany, who was killed by the Nazis in World War II for his stand for the Jews. He said, in ordinary life, we hardly realize that we receive a great deal more than we give, and that it is only with gratitude that life becomes rich. It is very easy to over, overestimate the value of our achievements in comparison to what we owe others. All right. So, hey, when you're in the middle of something bad, we need to remember what it is Hashem has done for us up until that point and what he's still doing. All right. Mr. Bonhoeffer there led many people to Yeshua. So did other people like Corey Ten Boom and her sister and others who were put in a place that they didn't want to be in, but it served a purpose. So... <clears throat> Now I'd like to talk about what happened to the priests, the consecration, how they were consecrated. This is really incredible. So in Leviticus 8, 23 and 24, it says, Moses slaughtered the ram, took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, then on a big toe of his right foot. Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. Now, sometimes I've seen people do this, and we've done this a few times in our lives, uh, the Rebitzin and I. We'll take some olive oil mixed with a little bit of wine, red wine or grape juice, and we'll do the same thing. We'll anoint each other on the right lobe, the right thumb, and the right 
toe of our foot and just commit each other to Hashem. We even do that with our house. We can put it on our doorways, our windows, and, and um, the entrance entrances to our house, different furniture, different things like that. We will commit, dedicate the house to him, even our car. So everything we have belongs to him. So in the eighth chapter of Leviticus, we read that we read that Moses consecrated Aaron and his sons to serve the Lord by taking the blood of the purification offering and putting on upon their right ear lobe, thumb of the right hand, and the big toe of their right foot. This represented the consecration of the entire body for the priestly service. <clears throat> it also provides an important lesson for the type of lives we are to lead as believers. So in order to live a consecrated life, <clears throat> we need to have these three following things. Consecrated ears that are attended to of Shem. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. John 10, 27. Consecrated hands that are ready to do his will and the good works he has pre-appointed for us to perform. Colossians 1, 10, bearing fruit in every good work. And lastly, consecrated feet that continually walk in his holy ways. No, I'm not going to show you my feet. <laughs> you don't want to see them. <laughs> so there's a little humor there. But in Psalm 37, 23, it says the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. That's incredible. So the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion, is when I brought your ancestors out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command. Obey me, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in the obedience to all I command you, that it may go well with you. Jeremiah 7, 22 and 23. So, in the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion of the Tav, Prophet Jeremiah denounced unthinking acts of worship that were part of an ungodly and unrighteous lifestyle. <clears throat> now, Shem's blessing comes with worship accompanied by real obedience. These people were sacrificing their children in the valley near Jerusalem. Okay, they were sacrificing them to Molech, Baal, and burning them alive. <clears throat> This is just one of the horrific acts that we're doing. So it remains a central teaching of the Tanakh or the Old Testament Jewish scriptures that Hashem desires obedience and a right heart rather than an empty compliance to the sacrificial system. All right? So <clears throat> Jews was just to make all these sacrifices and stuff, and yet nothing changes. You can, one continues to live their life as if nothing's so, kind of like in the, you know, make the, make the point fingers but and uh, people will go confess their sins to the priests but then they'll go right out and do the same thing and they know they're doing it they don't care there's a difference when you actually have a penitent heart and you're like i hate this sin in my life i know i when i sin i hate it and i, I come to god always and say please forgive me i know i sinned again that's one thing that's one thing to say uh father i i did this and this and this and this and this and then he's like okay uh, go say five whatever and and uh, <clears throat> hail Marys or whatever and our fathers and go your way and you're 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 forgiven. It doesn't bring repentance first of all when people just make sacrifices either, right? And every week or every day maybe they're going and killing an animal because they sinned again, but they want to continue to do it. And it's another thing when a person has a penitent heart. It's like, please help me with this. It's a difference. So Yeshua <clears throat> also drew attention to the problem of going through the motions of worshiping Hashem. When the heart was in reality far from Hashem, quoting Isaiah 29, 11, he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Matthew 15, 8 through 9. So the people of Israel held an almost superstitious belief. Superstition does not align with God's ways. Okay, just so you know. So if you're one of those people that says good luck or knock on wood or whatever, that's not okay. Okay, first of all, luck. You're simply naming a God and a false God, Loki. Okay, which transformed into luck. So you're, you're naming a, an evil spirit. The false god, okay? And all these other things, superstition does not align with God's ways. 
All right, so they held an almost superstitious belief also that temple rituals would guarantee their spiritual security. Now, I see this a lot happening in many places, <clears throat> not just with Jews, but many, many, many people even while being divorced from Hashem's moral laws regarding justice and righteousness. Like I said, you know, going and sacrificing your own children in the fire. I don't know what hops into people's minds thinking that's okay. So as followers of Yeshua, we also can follow into the same trap. Like I said, believing that maybe going to a church or a congregation, singing worship songs equals the right relationship with Hashem. Worshiping Hashem is much more than just what we would say punching in and out of the time clock at congregational services. Religious ritual cannot justify us or save us, okay? It's like saying, hey, I, I, I'm, I go to church or I go to the congregation, I sing and I worship and I give my tithes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't mean a thing. I know many people go to church or whatever every week and they're, they never accepted Yeshua, never believed in him. They just think that that stuff will get them saved. It's like living in a garage and saying, I'm a car, <clears throat> okay? Or a lot of things are happening nowadays where people just declare themselves whatever they feel like, okay? So if we want to progress in our spiritual journey, to move forward, not backward, Hashem has to be our beginning and then center. We need to obey him at all times. And this is found in Jeremiah 7.24. If you're honest with ourselves, we will admit that our sin nature resists Hashem, okay? Okay. It's so important, like I said, we need to read the word every day. We need to pray every day. <clears throat> and it's so important to do this. So uh, it says, Romans 8, 7, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws or Torah, and it never will. <clears throat> so there's no way in our own flesh we can do this. In Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Hmm. I will put my spirit in you. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. <clears throat> oh, that's to all of you who out there who say, well, the Old Testament's out the door. We don't need that anymore. I have to ask you, who do you believe in and where is your heart? I'm not saying they believe to salvation. But we should want and desire to follow his ways. They're beautiful. So, nevertheless, in Messiah Yeshua, we are transformed into a new person if we truly believe. And our innermost being comes to desire life that follows in the footsteps of the master to do his good works and also to share the gospel of his love with the world. <clears throat> what is gospel means good news. So, in conclusion, I would like to talk about peace with Hashem. Peace offerings, like I said, are the sacrifices that are shared by the worshiper and the priesthood. They both got to eat them, okay? Unlike the other ones where only the priesthood can eat part of the animal. So in Leviticus 7, the Torah reiterates the laws of the peace offerings, adding details about which parts of the animal are to be retained by the priesthood, who is fit to eat a peace offering, <clears throat> how quickly the meat has to be eaten, and what to do if not all the meat is eaten by the deadline. They had basically two days to eat it, and the third day had to go out. So our, a peace offering could be eaten by anyone, like I said, anywhere, so long as that person was in a state of ritual purity when he or she ate it. Okay, so if we were not pure for some reason, uh, <clears throat> which is stated in the book of um, uh, Leviticus, then they couldn't do it until they were pure. The Torah lists several different types of peace offerings, including votive offerings brought in fulfillment of vows, free will offerings, and the Thanksgiving offering. The Passover lamb was also a type of peace offering. So peace offerings, however, were never brought for sin. Okay, they did not atone or expiate anything. Instead, the peace offerings represent relationship, fellowship, and peace between Hashem and man. Eating of the peace offering was like eating from Hashem's own table. So when a person is not at peace with Hashem, he has no peace with Hashem. Yeah. Right? He has no peace at all. Hashem is the absolute subject of reality. So to be at war with Hashem is to be at war with reality. And like I said, in the end times, after when Yeshua comes and reigns for a thousand years, the only uh, offering that will be uh, needed to be brought to the temple where he will reign from will be the 
<coughs> thanks and a peace offering. So human beings, as we know, often live unhappy lives. And we know this, we see it all around us. They flee from pain and pursue pleasure, <coughs> trying to find comfort in the material world. You're never gonna do it. It's never gonna be enough. It might be good for a few minutes, a couple hours, maybe a day, but then you can be right back to that emptiness. A person does not realize that the reason for their constant angst or anxiety or whatever you want to call it is that he does not have peace with Hashem. That's it. When a person does not have peace with Hashem, they cannot have peace with themselves or with others. They rage at those who tread on their dignity or offend their pride. And, oh, my goodness. I see that all the time here in America. Well, my, you, you offended me or uh, my dignity, my rights, whatever you want to call it. That's all going to go in the trash, people. I'm going to tell you right, right now. Your so-called rights, they're gone. And not because the governments are taking them, because they're never written anywhere in the Bible. Okay? So, and if you don't like that, I'm sorry. But that's, that's just the truth. He justified, the person justifies their own actions at the expense of the relationships with their friends and family. All right? There are people who lose friends and family or whatever over these things. They use other people to try to prop up their ego, their fragile ego. They attempt to slake their thirsty soul with vices and to satisfy their fleshly appetites with indulgences. But it's all completely useless. In the end, it will all end. It won't be there. We're not going to have all these things to enjoy ourselves pretty soon. All these little vices will be gone. It'll be survival. And that's why it says in the Bible, in the end times, it will be worse than in the times of Noah. <clears throat> Guess what? In the times of Noah, before the flood came, not only was there horrible, horrible violence, homosexuality, all kinds of sexual sins, people eating people, all right? People eating children, people eating each other, people eating animals while they're still alive, etc., etc. It was that bad. And it will get worse than that in the end times. Why? There won't be any food left, hardly. What are people going to do to survive? They'll eat each other. All right, they'll kill their own children and eat them, whatever. They might even kill their dogs, cats, whatever. And they might go and kill an animal or even eat an animal while it's still alive. It says it'll be worse than that. So guess what? All these things will go out the window. So unless we, as a person, have peace with Hashem, there is no peace. And even in the end times, if you are at peace with Hashem, you will be at peace with what's going on around you no matter how bad it gets, <clears throat> okay? It says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. So the good news is that there can be peace with Hashem. The Apostle Paul says, while we were still Hashem's enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Romans 5, 10. So Hashem wants peace with us. He wants peace with human beings. More than human beings want peace with one another. Obviously, you can see that, right? <laughs> That is why he gave his son as a sacrifice, a peace offering between Hashem and man. So how great is peace? Now, I know that peace is the culmination of all things in this world, but how do I know it is to be so in the world to come? <clears throat> it is said in Isaiah 66, 12, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. The rabbi said, Great is peace, seeking that when the king Messiah comes, he will publish peace or establish peace, as it is said in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Leviticus 9, 9. Well, I would like to invite any of you who have not found your peace with Hashem to do so today through his son, Yeshua, by accepting his sacrifice that he made once and for all upon the cross as a Jew to bring salvation first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For all who believe in him will be saved. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through him. So like I said, you can be whoever you think you are. You can, have, you can be a Jew. You can be the nicest person on the face of the earth. Think you've never done anything wrong. Guess what? You're still a sinner. And you cannot have that peace with him unless you accept what was done by Yeshua on the cross. Okay. And accept his blood that he shed for you 
as a final sacrifice instead of animals, which cannot give you salvation. <clears throat> so I'd like to do that by inviting you to say this prayer with me today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu etarech ha-Yeshua b'Meshiach, Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah, Yeshua. Thank you. I hope that somebody out there has accepted Yeshua as their final sacrifice for their sins. And if you have, please write to us. We have a, a link down in the description area for uh, contacting us. You can contact us. We will give you a free gift. And it will be a pleasure to give that. I would hope somebody will, will do that. I want to hear from you. And so in order, um, like I said, to have peace with Hashem, we need to accept the final sacrifice that Yeshua did on the cross. And then understand that he rose from the dead on the third day, and he is getting ready to come back here soon, people. In the next few years, he will be back. Okay. It's not going to be very long. <clears throat> now, in order to uh, close this time together, I'm simply going to bless you and wish you Shabbat Shalom. Yevarechecha Adonai Beishmerecha Yael Adonai Panabelecha Bichuneka Yisa Adonai Panabelecha Vesehemlecha Besim lecha shalom. Beshem Yeshua Hamashiach. Sarah shalom shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Shalom. Shalom and Shabbat shalom to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you have been blessed. Also, I want to thank you all for your prayers. Those of you who prayed for me. Uh, I had some health issues, still do a little bit, but the, I'm doing well. And also want to thank you for uh, your support. Those of you who do support us, uh, we really, really appreciate you. And there is a link for those who'd like to uh, support us in any way. If you feel that you are blessed through our ministry, uh, there's also a link if you'd like to dedicate a Torah portion, a parashah to somebody or a special event in your life. <clears throat> there's also a link there also if you'd like to have counseling done in a biblical may manner uh my wife uh, gabriela that is a licensed counselor in italy and can help you uh there is a website for that down in the links also both in english and italian so if you'd like that those are available to you we hope we can hear from you uh Please make comments. Obviously, we will not allow negative comments. We will eliminate those. But any comments that are uplifting, which is what we're called to do, we would love to, to hear from you. So thank you for joining us today. May you be blessed.